So hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the Science Coordinator for the partnership. And today we are very pleased to have Craig Allen, who is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. He's the station leader of the Jemez Mountains Field Station based at Bandelier National Monument in northern New Mexico. And Craig today is going to be presenting to us on forest changes near and far and restoration in the context of changing climate. This webinar is being hosted by one of uh, the Desert LCC's critical management question teams, our, our number four team. They are looking at the physiological impacts of climate change on species and have a whole webinar series that you can view um, from our YouTube channel. So I will just want to thank you all for joining us today. And thank you very much, Craig Allen, for sharing this work with us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Sounds good. And we'll get right to it. Um, so indeed, as the title, we're going to talk about forest changes. And we're going to start global. And then we're going to come back to the Southwest and um, recap changes in the Southwest a bit. And, and end with a little discussion about restoration, sort of in quotes, what does that mean in a, in a climate change world? Uh, just contextually, no surprise here, the famous hockey stick figure, but important context, the planet has not only been warming recently, um, northern hemisphere warmer than any time in the last thousand years, and is, if the climate models are at all accurate, will be much warmer as we proceed this century, essentially globally, um, which shows up in the most recent set of IPCC reports um, in terms of, of temperature. The strongest projection is temperature. So a lot of the focus I'm going to talk about is what does warmer temperature mean for forests on this planet. One of the things it means is, is that warmer temperature is driving also projections of significantly drier soils globally as we move forward. And of course, that will have significant effects on, on vegetation, including forests. Um, a key point of that, which we'll talk about again in a few minutes, but is this, this nonlinear increase in the atmospheric moisture demand, or as you see on the y-axis, the, the more technical term, vapor pressure deficit. But as temperature increases linearly, all else being kept the same, that the unmet demand for moisture in the atmosphere goes up nonlinearly. So it's pulling on the vegetation and on the soils to try to reach the equilibrium water content. Um, and we also, and so we see these kind of nonlinear tipping points in response to warming um, with the atmosphere that way. And that's probably partly behind this observed increase in, in wildfires, which we're not going to talk about much. This is a west wide. Um, but again, you get this nonlinearity with linear temperature increase. So we're going to focus on these two sets of forest disturbance processes, fire, drought stress, and just be aware that in the, in the drought stress tree mortality category, I'm including, for the most part, things that are biotic amplifying agents, tree-killing insects, which are attacking trees that are too stressed to defend themselves, even though there are other temperature-related dynamics, actually, with the insect populations themselves. Um, this slide is just to make the point, there's many projections moving. Fire, the, the process of fire is not well modeled globally in models linked to, to uh, climate change projections. But in the efforts to do that, essentially all of the models project a lot more fire activity on planet Earth moving forward. This is one example. Um, this slide is just to highlight a point that I will make again more concretely, uh, and particularly here in the Southwest, but about the interactions between warming temperatures and multiple disturbance processes and what that means to, um, to forests. This is an example from the Amazon Basin. It's a figure out of uh, the last round of, of uh, big IPCC reports. Um, but it shows that, I mean, the real risk to the Amazon is thought actually to be these interactions between land use, um, driving opening forests and fire, and the feedbacks of that with, um, with warming and, and physiological stress then on, on the trees. 
this is a diagram showing that with a lot of positive feedbacks. And the p only point of this is, again, not to look at this in any detail, but that warming temperature amplifies the number of the positive feedbacks associated with these disturbance processes. Hey, Craig, you're coming across a little quiet. If you could um, speak directly into the microphone. Okay. Um, I'll bring it a little closer. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about drought and heat-induced tree mortality globally. Um, these are images from all around the planet of drought and heat-induced tree mortality events uh, in process. Um, this paper that five years ago with 20 colleagues around the planet, we published this first global overview on drought and heat-induced tree mortality. And two important bottom lines on that is, one, that we already see examples in all forested types on all continents, you know, from the Amazon to Alberta to Australia to Arizona, that um, examples of, of forest mortality from particularly, the second key point, it's hotter drought. The big events are occurring from drought but drought that is being uh, amplified, the stress on the trees, by warmer conditions um, recently. Uh, these are in that 2010 paper, which is just summarizing data in the scientific literature. These are sort of the core localities that were documented in the literature through 2009, which is what it took with the lag to get into the paper in 10. I updated that for the IPCC report that came out last spring, the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, volume, and so you'll see a version of this figure in there, toggling back and forth. So in, um, with data through 2013, so four years of literature, um, we're seeing a lot of more documentation. Doesn't mean there's more of it happening globally. It's actually one of the challenges is we need a global observation system for forest health and tree mortality. We don't have uh, a comprehensive enough system to actually know if trend is getting worse on the planet. But in some regions, we know that the events are unprecedented. One such example um, from Australia, we're going to look in south, the, we're going to zoom in on that new locality that uh, is an event in 2011 in southwest Australia near Perth. Um, the in the 130 or so years of European record keeping there, they had never, they thought this tree, Eucalyptus marginata, Jara, was essentially invulnerable to, to drought. There have been some very severe droughts, hadn't seen uh, mortality be an issue. But in February 2011, with an extreme heat wave on top of the second driest year in the instrument record, the canopy started to collapse. This is what the circle point is what the grid cell globally looks like on a soil moisture and a globally monthly uh, surface temperature uh, uh, you know, pattern for the, for the planet. And you see that you had this intersection of extremely dry conditions with record warmth. And that is the recipe that we're seeing around the planet where we get uh, big die-off events. Um, with some colleagues, um, actually some you'll know, Dave Brashears there at the University of Arizona and Nate McDowell, who's next door here to me in Los Alamos National Laboratory. We, we have a paper that's uh, in review at the moment where we're summarizing the, the role of temperature in particular on, on risks of tree mortality. This is a paper that Nate led, Nate McDowell led a few years ago. There's many physiological processes. Trees don't die easily. You don't live for hundreds of years if you're going to go down um, every time there's a drought. And drought happens in a relative sense in all forests, um, just the inherent variability in climate. So how is it that trees survive? What are the compensatory processes that, that reduce their vulnerability? And there are many, and they're interactive, which is what makes tree mortality um, at the, to, up to this point, we're not able to model it successfully in, in models on any broad scale um, because it's so uh, complexly interactive. Um, but a key point here in this next slide is that this, the, the new diagram is essentially the diagram on the right just reframed where the old line is the dashed line. And
and the red line is showing the response with warming. Uh, we don't have time to go through these one by one, but the point is in every case, these physiological processes that affect tree mortality become, the red is in a direction of more risk, more vulnerability to mortality, and all of these processes individually as well as interactively become more uh, risky for the tree with warmer temperatures. Um, a simple way conceptually to think about this from literally just a water stress standpoint is if um, that this little simple climate envelope diagram, so say that's ponderosa pine, that's the climate space on a temperature precipitation uh, two axis climate space where ponderosa pine grows successfully today and that arcing red line is the, the threshold of mortality, whereas you get to the upper right, it's either too hot or too dry um, for ponderous pine to occur. That happens episodically during droughts. It's happened in the past. We have documented in the 1950s drought the hotter, drier margins of ponderous pine forests in the southwest. There was a significant amount of mortality. But with projected climate changes, you can see that that it may be that these envelopes move to a place where most of the time the climate space is not suitable for trees or a larger portion of the geographic space. But in this case, where you're just moving the envelope only in a warming direction, that a similar thing can happen, that you can actually move the climate space can be unsuitable for the forests that are there today. So. Um, there's another whole set of issues associated with regeneration, the regeneration niche, what can come back on these sites. But um, the points I'm focusing on are what, what, what is likely to happen to historic forests that are dominant where they are today because they are tuned to historic climate conditions uh, and certainly not the conditions that are projected. This slide is just illustrating that um, time on the x-axis, drought stress on the y-axis, what shifting baseline temperature, warming, does by makes those mortality thresholds become more frequent. Um, I won't belabor that point, but to just say, state that that's basically something that with high certainty we can expect globally in the relative sense essentially everywhere. Um, Similarly, there's evidence that um, warmer conditions, all else being equal, trees, if you subject them to the same drought stress, but one is warmer, one condition is warmer than the other, trees die more quickly. All right, actually a classic experiment that Henry Adams, uh, did with his PhD work under Dave Brashear is at Biosphere 2, they showed that trees died almost 20% quicker in the four degrees warmer treatment. Anyway, there are lots of short droughts compared to long droughts, just in a, in a distribution things, and those short droughts under warmer conditions will then be more likely to cause tree mortality. Again, kind of a first principles projection into the future. Um, there's another set of projections that, um, well, there's both theoretical and empirical work that is emerging now that indicates that warming is particularly bad news for tall trees, big trees. Um, some of the most iconic and revered trees and forests on planet Earth. Um, this paper, this is the this uh, is in press. It will be uh, released um, on the 18th of May, um, so just literally next week. Um, led by Nate McDowell, and I participated in this, but Nate basically, you, Darcy's law is basically the physics behind plant water, movement of water in plants. And um, this is a theoretical take, essentially, um, and it's from a theory standpoint, basically it's harder to get water to the top of a tall tree. That's, uh, it's, it's more complicated than that, but um, but the essence of it, from a theoretical standpoint, um, it's clear that taller vegetation will be more at risk um, as uh, under warming temperatures, all else being equal. There's another paper that's in review um, currently at Nature Plants that's an empirical look 
at forest risk, and it's basically looked at plots, plot data worldwide from forests where we can see the relative size distribution of the trees that have died in hot drought events, and uh, indeed disproportionately large trees uh, suffer more and die more, uh, both in terms of growth and mortality um, in these warm drought events. Bad news for, for, for old trees on planet Earth um, with warming. Um, this is a, uh, I think I'm going to skip this. this well, we, we can do it very quickly. Even forests, this is Australia, Southeast Australia in Victoria, South Wales, New South Wales, and this is a species of eucalypt that's similar to um, lodgepole pine in its reproductive habit. It keeps um, seeds, a seed bank, in the canopy inside the, the, the fruiting structures. They look like little cones. And so these forests burn periodically in stand replacing, hot stand replacing fires that kill the trees, and then it showers trees, uh, seeds post fire onto the landscape and reproduces abundantly. What's happening with warming, with warmer drought conditions in this part of the world is fire frequency is going up such that the forest is burning before the reproduction from the last fire is old enough to have a, a canopy seed bank. And so these are a series of slides that from uh, recent work by Dave Bowman and colleagues there. And the, from top to bottom, you see the, the unburned forest, the abundant in B, the abundant regeneration after the first burn, and after the second burn, almost no regeneration. And after a third burn, nada. The regeneration is, is extinguished. And this is a colossal change over a large area of these forests. Um, but this is, and there are projections for similar things to happen, for example, in the Yellowstone ecosystem. By mid-century, trying to model fire responses to warming climate, fire frequency goes up enough in their models that lodgepole pine gets squeezed out of the landscape for similar reasons. reasons. They're actually starting to aerial seed this experiment with this landscape, basically to try to regenerate these forests in national parks artificially. So zooming in more locally, this is where I'm based here at the south end of the Rocky Mountains, kind of the intersection between the Rockies and the desert basin ranges in the Hamas. Been here for 30 years. I want to highlight a paper um, that many of you probably are familiar with, um, but I'm going to go through it a little bit, that Park Williams, who at the time was postdocing at Los Alamos next door, led. Um, and, the, and the point of this paper is contained clearly in the title. It's about temperature. Temperature as a potent driver of regional forest drought stress and tree mortality. Um, basically, Park, it was an outgrowth of his dissertation work pulled together all the tree ring data that he could muster for this region. And what we're defining as the southwest is the area in yellow there, primarily Arizona and New Mexico. Um, but hundreds of thousands of, of tree ring uh, measurements in this record. And this is back to the record of regional tree growth back to 1896. And like 95% of the records were uh, pinon, ponderosa pine, or Douglas fir. Turned out all three of those species statistically behaved um, almost identically, so we were able to merge them. This is the regional tree growth record going back, in this case, only to 1896, which we in, is used to illustrate this because that's the instrumental record goes back that far. So more growth above the, the one line, the, the average line, less below. Um, and it turns out what Park, um, working through these data, found was that um, two simple climate predictors could, with a very high confidence you see down there with an R squared of 0.82, um, predict tree growth regionally. And it's important to recognize this is at the scale of the region. That's the scale at which this data analysis took place. Um, but you see there the, um, to back up, yeah, the red is the tree growth. The black is, is the prediction with this forest drought stress index, two variables, preceding winter spring precip and 
no surprise there. When it's wetter in the preceding winter, trees grow well. Conifers grow well in the southwest. This is why tree ring dating even works. And this has been well known for a long time. The new part of this was that warmer temperatures during the growing season depress tree growth in the southwest, at least for these conifers. Strongly so. More than half the strength of this correlation came from adding the temperature component to it. And indeed, this is the strongest single climate predictor of tree growth that uh, tree ring uh, growth measures that anybody's ever done. Um, we converted, so daily max temperature during the growing season is the other predictor you need, which can be converted into this vapor pressure deficit, this VPD you see up there on the screen, which is this unmet demand for moisture by the atmosphere which, as we mentioned briefly previously, goes up non-linearly with um, warming temperature, warmer temperatures. So the reason, by the way, I'll mention this, that the reason we believe that, um, and the reason we converted it to vapor pressure deficit instead of just leaving it as daily max temp for, uh, during the growing season, is that we think that when it's dry, and it's warmer that physiologically what's going on is that these trees, to avoid dehydrating during the, this, this warm growing season period, they are closing their stomata, the little pores on their needle surfaces where the gas exchange with the atmosphere takes place. That's where they lose water through transpiration. So when they start to reach the, the breaking point from a water standpoint, um, they can shut those down, but when they do that, they're also closing off gas exchange for photosynthesis, which is not a big deal in the short run. Plants do this all the time, close their stomata, but when they're under chronic protracted drought stress for weeks, months, it reduces their ability to photosynthesize so much that they grow more poorly, um, is the thought. Anyway, I'm going to use this because that correspondence between forest, this, this two-factor predictor of tree growth, which we labeled forest drought stress index, or FDSI, which you see on the y-axis label here. So again, good growth above the zero line, um, poor growth below. This is that period back to 1896, again, which we're showing. and. Um, and you see there's a lot of variability through time. And I'm going to walk through that because an important part of what's going on here in the southwest is land use change has affected our forests. This, these uh, reddish or orangish colored backgrounds are drought periods. So you see the late 1890s, early 1900s, we were in drought. Um, that dotted line, the dotted red line, represents the time period um, well, the end of the, of the na native or natural surface fire regime. That's when fire suppression effectively started um, in the late 1890s, inadvertently as a result of overgrazing. So, but prior to that, fire regulated tree density by thinning out most of the young trees. So the surface fires have stopped by 1900, and then in the early 1900s regionally, we have this wet period, great tree growth, um, including um, the green arrow marks the classic 1919 pulse of tree regeneration remarked upon by foresters at the time. It wasn't just that year. It was a generally favorable period. So we had cohorts of trees established there abundantly, regionally, without fire thinning them. <clears throat> there was a drought period, a significant drought period in the 1950s, actually the 1940s through the 1950s, um, but for the forests were not yet, the, the, the forest density is increasing, but fire suppression, which is in, improving technologically and in terms of the investment people were putting into it, was able to mostly keep a lid on it in the 50s drought. Then in this period from the late 70s to the mid 90s, another wet period, and all those little trees that established um, early in the century grew up and we got these thickets. 
Um, the, basically, the three-dimensional fuel structure changed. The forest became denser in terms of trees per acre. And there was this increase in these vertical fuels, these ladder fuels. So there's much more risk of fire getting into the canopies. And indeed, starting in 1996, this next red arrow, we had a near snowless winter in parts of the southwest. And um, we started to pop big crown fires that suppression could no longer keep a lid on at that point. The extreme fuels were in place. And as we went into this period, which has turned into an extended period of drought, um, We've seen a lot of mortality through high severity fire and increasingly all kinds of dieback processes, including big insect outbreaks associated with these stressed forests. Um, oh, that's a little reminder to tell me. However, this oscillatory behavior, which is tied to um, the Pacific, to the ocean, particularly in our part of the world, to probably to the Pacific decadal oscillation, would do sometime soon probably in the next decade for that to come back. And indeed, here's the PDO index monthly back to about 1900. And this is through March, I believe, this year. But you can see the index. We've been in um, this period. Here's where it shifted. When the PDO is in this, for the Southwest, the wet phase, here was that period from the late 70s through uh, the latter part of the 90s. And we've been down in this zone, but you can see there's indications it might be coming back. Certainly, it looks like there will be an El Nino of some strength now this year. Anyway, that could be good news for this part of the world, at least for a while. Um, I wanted to also show that, again, that this forest drought stress index, which, again, is strongly driven by warmer temperatures, is highly correlated here with the area affected by bark beetle mortality, which is essentially a surrogate for drought stress mortality in this region. These are done by aerial inventories by, on a state-by-state -state basis by Forest Service and state forestry people, and by the area of tree-killing fire, which is what's graphed here. So this index, which was built to predict tree growth, is also a surprisingly strong predictor of these tree killing disturbance processes. Um, again, because all are related to forest drought stress and, again, to hammer this point home, related to the warming temperatures in this region. Um, so looking, what, did that, what does this look like on the ground? Well, here is a cumulative map showing for the period since 96, the, in orange, the area mapped of, of tree-killing bark beetle uh, patches on the landscape, and in red, the high-severity tree-killing fire patches in the region. And all told, since 96, it's about 20% of the forest area of the, of the region affected by high levels of, of tree mortality from just these two processes. Um, well, maybe this is not so unusual in a long-term context. Maybe long-term drought, which we, we, drought we know has occurred in the past, how unusual is what we're seeing today? So here's a longer-term perspective on that forest drought stress index um, regionally, um, because we can reconstruct it with tree rings. Um, and so this is back to AD 1000. The annual FDSI is in the gray. Um, there's a 10-year smooth in red, which is what you should focus on. So just a couple things about this. One, you see that it, there's this oscillatory behavior um, that it's as far back as we can reconstruct. Um, droughts are entirely normal in this part of the region at all time scales. So, um, and indeed, with the arrow here, you see what has been uh, thought to be the worst drought in the last millennium, the late 1500s mega drought, uh, so-called. Um, the dashed line, the black dashed line that was added, represents the threshold of the worst 50% of the years of that severe mega drought, which we, a little bit arbitrarily, uh, we know when you reach that level, 
you're, it's tree killing levels of drought. There's some evidence the late, that that mega drought uh, truncated tree populations um, in the region. Um, the other thing, note in the lower right corner, the green circle is circling the year 2002. And if you look across, you can see that 2002 was the most stressful year for forest growth regionally in the last thousand years. And by a fair amount, there really is no other uh, year that's close to that. So objectively, 2002 was the worst year for tree growth uh, in the last thousand years. We don't think that's because it was drier than any year um, in the last 2,000 years, but it's that combination of warmth, um, which is certainly driving the index. So for the really bad news about um, forests coming out of this paper, is that you can also project into the future levels of forest drought stress because those two predictor variables, winter precip and uh, growing season temperatures, are the, the climate projection models uh, generate. And indeed, so we used several models, ran them in ensemble mode multiple, you know, hundreds of times, and averaged them, and this is what the uh, those two climate drivers look like regionally in the models, the ensemble runs we did. So you see a small decrease in mean precip there in the top panel. The mean value is the blue line. The, the variance you see around that line is the inner quartile of the variance in the ensemble runs. The, but what you see is that in the lower panel that that warm season vapor pressure deficit is what's really changing a lot. That is a reflection of the warming temperatures. And this is what it does when you combine them together to the forest drought stress index for the region. So the black line is the actual measured FDSI, basically tree growth, for the period 1896 moving forward. The red is the modeled runs, the ensemble runs. Um, again, averaging many runs, so you see they pick up the average of what has happened in the last century pretty well, but they're, because we're looking at the average of all these runs, they're not picking up that decadal scale oscillation variability. Circled again in green is that worst year, 2002 in the record, and now I add that sort of uh, tree mortality threshold from the mega drought, and you see that by mid-century, um, if the climate models turn out to uh, be correct, the, uh, the mean values of forest drought stress start to exceed the worst years of the worst mega droughts in the last millennium, which we know reach tree-killing tree levels of drought stress. Of course, again, keep in mind that this projection moving forward is, is – um, is averaged over many different um, different runs, many different uh, basically many different futures averaged. The way it oh sorry I, I thought there was another slide in there. The way it would really play out is that again soon it'll probably be better than that. You know when the Pacific when the PDO sloshes back to the for us the wetter phase that it'll, things will get better in the southwest here for a couple decades, but then by mid-century it'll be about due to go uh, to slosh back to the dry phase for us if the oceans continue to behave as they have in the past. But at that point it'll be worse. So, um, But in any case, by the second half of this century, it's unprecedented levels of forest drought stress. And so it's hard to envision how current forests the historic forests that, that, that became dominant under actually already a cooler climate regime, um, how they can persist without significant reorganization um, as we move into the mid and, and the latter parts of the century. And indeed, there's other many other projections. This is one that came out, I don't know, two months ago or so, or so in science. Um, other efforts where people project the southwest um, as I'm sure you all know, um, is one of the parts of the world where the projections are most secure for drying conditions moving forward. 
part of that is driven by the warming in this set of modeling here, because um, they're actually looking at soil moisture balances, which are affected by that moisture. So, um, so yeah, we've been seeing this rapid reorganization since 96, essentially, of these uh, tree killing disturbance processes uh, that are driving rapid uh, changes in forests. Um, I just want to highlight that um, the tree mortality that was really prominent in the southwest from about 2002 to 2004, with some ramp up again then from, oh, say 2011 through 14, um, that this is all up and down the elevational gradient and indeed even affecting grasses, I think, yes, uh, down into juniper. This is uh, just north of Albuquerque. This is the last woody plant down the elevational gradient, one seed juniper uh, a year ago. Uh, just wholesale um, dieback of these junipers. Um, grasses, similar to the summer of 13, uh, 11, 12, 13 were very difficult in northern New Mexico um, those years and actually caused a lot of mortality of all life forms out in the, this is the back country of Bandelier where I work. Um, more specifically about fire in this particular landscape where we have very good record, we have back to 1909 suppression records of, of fire activity. These are the points of fire ignitions by cause. But what I wanted to take you through decade by decade is the area burned maps which are particularly uh, telling. So here in the early part of the 20th century where people, um, here's the teens, where we see circles, we had a size class and a location but not an actual perimeter. Some of the early records are like that. Keep in mind that people are, this, these areas are near roadless. Well, they were essentially roadless. People are accessing these on foot and horseback with hand tools. There's no air support, there's no radios, there's none of that. And we are successfully suppressing fire. Many, many ignitions occurring, but they are being successfully suppressed through most of the 20th century. Here's the 30s, the 40s, even during the 50s drought, uh, the 1960s, 1970s. Um, the fuels are now to a point that they popped a couple of fires, the one on the southeast here, this was, a, at the time, that's a 15,000-acre fire event for scale. Um, that was a huge fire at the time. It was being studied for the next 20 years, the 77 La Mesa fire. The 80s, we're now in that wet period. The fuels are there to now sustain crown fire and ponderosa pine systems, but suppression is able to be effective during the wet period. And we get to the 90s, suppression was effective through the first half of the decade, but we're starting to pop these bigger wildfires in the second half. And now watch the 2000s. This big fire on the right is the Cerro Grande fire, 43,000 acres. That's the billion dollar fire that burned into Los Alamos. Okay, that was almost, people were shocked at the size of that fire and the severity. Well, there's the 2010s with uh, Almost the whole eastern flank of the mountain range burned out by, and a lot of it, high severity fire. And then through 213. So you can see this trend that despite much more suppression capacity, we're not able to keep a lid on it during this current intersection of more severe fire weather, warm drought, with the buildup of extreme fuels. Um, but a comment on, on these big fires. So, for instance, this fire, the, the, the Thompson Ridge Fire, 156,000 acres that occurred in 2011, was at the time the biggest fire in New Mexico history, quote unquote. When you hear that, that this was the biggest fire ever in Arizona, New Mexico, wherever, keep in mind that that's only since 1900 or so when we have written documentation. We know from things like tree ring records. So the Jemez has a very dense network of a fire scar network, um, which comes about from working closely with, you know, Tom Swetnam and many colleagues there at the, at the tree ring lab over the last 30 years. Um, these are, look, each of these dots represents 10 to 30 trees sampled, and there's more underway now. 
recording these histories of widespread surface fires that aren't killing the forest, but we're thinning them. And we just note that we're quite sure that 1748 was far and away in the southwest region the biggest fire year from a standpoint of acreage burned. That the red dots are trees that recorded fire by scar on the tree. Didn't kill the tree, but recorded fire. Um, every mountain range essentially in the southwest we sampled looks like this. Pretty much every mountain range in the region uh, had widespread surface fire that year. So uh, tens of millions of acres burned just in this region that year. Um, the point I wanted to make about that is, as an ecologist, I'm not so concerned about the acres burned in these fires today. These 100,000 acre fires, it's the, the acre, acreage burned is not anomalous in a historical context, okay? What is anomalous is the size of the tree killing patches, which I'll illustrate in the next couple slides here. So this is for the east half of the mountain range only. Since 77, the red are the tree killing fire patches as mapped off of, of satellite imagery. Um, it's basically gutted the forests in the eastern flank of the Hamas Mountains. These are systems that, again, where stand replacing fire is natural, is historically natural in higher elevation forests, for instance, just across the way from this to the east of the Sangre de Cristos, there's a, quite a bit of high elevation spruce fir forest that had uh, you know, one to two century return interval stand replacing fire. The Hamas, that's not what was characteristic of the Hamas nor most forests in the southwest. It's these big patches where all the tree seed sources are being eliminated that are of concern if you're trying to maintain historic forest structure in these regions. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that's there. So this is what that looks like on the ground. So this is day one run of the Las Conchas fire, uh, reburned a fire from 96. There's a 30,000 acre patch there where there are no live trees to serve as seed sources. And ponderosa pine needs live trees to survive the fires. Things, it's favoring plant life forms that, that re-sprout. Our tree species in this part of the world don't do that. So shrubs, uh, aspen, with the aspen at high elevation, none of our, our conifers don't, essentially. Um, but we're favoring uh, transitions to, um, to these more resilient re-sprouting life forms, like these shrub fields. Um, and of course, all these things are interactive. Um, again, without belaboring that point too much. Um, except to say, and don't let the spaghetti diagram, don't look too close at this, but this is looking at spatial scale from fine to broad, from left to right, and three different forest uh, or disturbance processes in the region. And conceptually, we know they're interactive in the ways that all these spaghetti diagram arrows show, but we are nowhere close to being able to model these interactions realistically in ecosystem models linked to future climate moving forward. I mean, we're, we're, we're making small steps at modeling them individually, things like tree mortality or fire, but certainly nothing of this conceptual level of complexity. So, um, and I'm not seeing you all. Normally, if you give a talk like this in front of an audience and I can see you, there's usually a lot of like, ooh, um, you know, there's a lot of hard news, um, especially if you care about um, forests, um, big old trees um, in, in any part of the world. So is there some good news? How can we respond? What, what, uh, what does this mean? Do we have any good options? Or is it kind of like, um, you know, as in the cartoon here, damned if you do or damned if you don't? Um, the point I would like to make is that I think we need to be more future-looking, as we're, we are indeed, from an ecological standpoint at least, um, we're into the Anthropocene, um, in a sense where, where human actions have had a big effect here, and that um, as land managers, um, we can't be too backward-looking, even though um, we can still learn many things by looking at the history 
of, of ecosystems on these landscapes, but we're not going to be able to restore those. Thus the quotes around restoration. Um, what we're seeing in this region is that um, these ecosystems are responding as they must um, rapidly to, to this window of warmer and drier climate. Um, again, I expect that we'll get some reprieve of that sometime in the next few years, uh, next decade anyway. If the PDO behaves as it has in the past, it'll be due to slosh back again. Um, but, there, but there's another whole set of things that are different today, these three unnatural drivers or these three anthropogenic drivers. Maybe that's better. People are part of nature. Um, but it's the historic suppression of fire, the associated change in fuels and forest structure, um, and the warming. And in concert, these things have amplified the risk of these, other, of these various tree mortality processes. There are things that land managers can do. Some of them are tried and true. The first one, fire mechanical treatments. Uh, the second one is basically we need to be very strategic. Only a small part of the, we're only gonna be able to treat certainly mechanically, very small fractions of the forested landscapes that are out there yet. We should need to be strategic about breaking up the landscape scale continuity of these high hazard fuels that's developed in the last century. Um, if we care about the old trees, which are disproportionately important, by the way, for things like amount of carbon they store on the landscape, but have many other values, um, that will take some special effort because they're increasingly at risk. Um, but success is not guaranteed. Um, what we want to do, we think, I mean, what, what some of us advocate working with land managers is to, inc to, to, um, to foster the ability of forests in this region to respond more incrementally rather than overnight with these um, stand replacing fire events, for example. I don't view the forest die-off and uh, as as catastrophic that's gone on in this region. The, the tree mortality, it's you just can't sustain a thousand trees per acre during a drought. Even without the warming, there would have been a lot of tree mortality during the current drought episode. Um, but anyway, if we do want to preserve some of these older elements of the forest, the historic forest, we're going to need to act with some urgency because nature is responding. Um, these are the things we know how to do. Um, and then there are some societal issues. Um, one of them is uh, illustrated by this cartoon, this cognitive dissonance that exists about fire in society because the Smokey Bear campaign has been so successful at saying, at, at convincing the public that fire is, is almost wholly negative. Um, so thus this cartoon. Um, about poor Smokey trying to figure it out, uh, whether, whether forest fires are important to keep to prevent forest fires. We can see, this is a photograph in the Gila National Forest taken after um, only, a, only a month or, oops, excuse me, only a month or so after the Whitewater Baldy, Whitewater Baldy Fire of 2002, which was nearly 300,000 acres. So a summer after the record-setting Las Conchas fire in New Mexico of 156,000 acres, we had this fire. And large portions of this fire, particularly in the ponderosa pine type, in the Gila wilderness where fire had been allowed to burn over the last 30 years in an increasingly unrestrained way, was not being suppressed because in the wilderness it could be allowed to burn. And we see these kind of outcomes a lot in that part of the world, that the forest structure had changed enough that it was not uh, a canopy fire, even in these severe burning conditions. This slide, near final slide, is to highlight just that, um, well, as the, as, the, uh, as the caption says, we're all in it together, that um, this, this, the, the cartoon here is a little bit of a snarky take on the, the Los Alamos controlled burn is referring to the Cerro Grande fire of 2000, which was set by the Park Service as a, as a prescribed burn, and it burned um, 
400 homes in Los Alamos and much of the laboratory. Point is, the cartoonist, Smokey, represents the Forest Service, and they don't make the distinction. If we're going to treat forests, we're going to have to do it collaboratively. So in closing, despite the risk and uncertainty, the, the, there are management things we can do that affect the fate of forests. Um, I think there's hope. People care a lot about forests. Um, but there's so much inertia, both individually and collectively, in how we do business, um, that I would assert we need to act with urgency, work collaboratively, and we're going to need to continue to learn and expect surprises because it's, uh, we're in a new, a new era here. So with that, I close. Great. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, I appreciate you taking a moment to talk about some potential management actions, um, things that could be done in response to some of the issues um, that you've been telling us about. So we do have a few minutes for questions. So folks, um, if you have a question, you'll be able to raise your hand in the WebEx window by going to the participant button. And then you'll, when you press that, it'll turn blue and you'll see a list of all the participants on the webinar. And at the bottom, there's a button that says raise hand. So Craig's going to take a look at that and uh, call on folks who have their hands raised. You'll need to press star six to unmute your phone when Craig calls on you. So Craig, do you see any hands there? Yeah, help me, Amy, because I'm not, I haven't done this before, so I'm not seeing hands, but maybe I'm not reading this right. Oh, I see a hand. Okay, so Jason Thomas. If you could press star six and go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, I'm from the Pueblo of Laguna, and we're um, developing a, um, a forest management plan for us. And we would like to introduce fire back into the regime of the, uh, of the lands we have. But I'm concerned about, because um, we get our stand assessments from the BIA, and a lot of the people may, might not be um, up on the current research that you're talking about. So I, I, I but I, I don't know, and I just want to get your feel for that, how hard it might be to, to, to write the prescriptions for these with, you know, with fire back in the regimes. Cause, uh, you know, I'm not a forester. I'm a, I'm more of a mammal person, but I've been taking on this job. So and that's it. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know enough about the specifics there, Jason, to probably be real helpful. Um, uh, and I'm not, you know, increasingly, certainly Forest Service folks have been, one of the other things I didn't mention is one of the tools is they've been um, using natural ignitions and letting them burn more, sort of like the Ahila example, but in non-wilderness settings as well kind of drawing a box, still suppressing. It's a kind of a suppression action, but it's a managed suppression, drawing a box at defensible boundaries and letting it burn. So increasingly, there's a lot of experience about um, fire response in, in different veg types. So I mean, I think that would be one thing to do, would be to reach out, particularly in this region, the Forest Service folks uh, who have that more experience. All right, thanks, Craig. Um, if anyone else has a question, if you could press that raise hand button. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and, um, in case that's not working for folks, I'm going to go ahead and unmute the line um, so that folks could go ahead and just speak up to ask a question. The conference is now in talk mode. All right, so all lines are open now. Does anyone else have a question for Chris? Yeah, well, this is Brett Bruce in Denver. Hi, Craig. Um, Brett. I'm just wondering, has anybody uh, tried to map where the forests are going? I mean, you've talked about how this is going to impact historical forests. But I would think with, with climate models and, and, and so forth, there could be some effort to, to look at where the next best place for these forests to establish themselves might be and whether that has been 
incorporated into management uh, decisions? Um, well, there's certainly been modeling efforts of that sort, but there's a lot of uncertainties with them, kind of for the reasons I was mentioning. Um, a lot of the a lot of the modeling has been this kind of climate envelope modeling, where they you take if if the climate model X is correct. Um, if you look at where the kind of conditions ponderous pine needed to grow historically, currently, and you say where will those conditions be in the future if the climate models are correct, and so you know, in the general characterization is that things need to meet, move upslope to as uh, you know that uh, it'll be uh, what is today cooler and moister but as it warms it'll be similar to, to warmer drier where it is today or north um, but there's a lot of challenges with that there's inaccuracies I guess um, there's other reasons why plants move um, the other thing that's needed and people are doing this our group included is we're trying to look at well what is coming back rather than model it what is coming back in these stands where there's been a lot of, of tree mortality from drought and insects or where there's been stand replacing fire? Um, part of the problem with that is, though, is that it's been a short time frame since these, it's only been the last 15 years we've been having this really high level of mortality in the region, and we've been in drought during this period. So there hasn't been a fair chance, in a sense, for um, for tree establishment to reoccur um, because naturally it occurs in pulses during the wetter decadal scale windows and we haven't had that yet but we're definitely out there looking to see what's coming back um, and, and what we're seeing for the most part is that again the absence of conifer tree seed sources is a major limitation on tree recovery. Great, thank you. Well, we are about out of time here. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for your participation in the webinar today, and especially thank you to Craig for making the time to be with us. And as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the Desert South DC YouTube channel. You can find that in the link on our website or by search, doing an internet search for Desert LCC YouTube, and uh, you should find it near the top of the list. So thanks again, Craig, and thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.